In 2020, Cyberpunk 2077 finally came out. And with it, one of the craziest launches ever in gaming history. The 10th of December will forever be remembered for two events. It's the International Day of Human Rights, but it's also, ironically, the day when an incomplete game built by developers with a giant clock in front of their desk was released to an overhyped public. And let's clarify it once and for all. People are not disappointed because they imagined things beyond limit. It was rather the opposite. CDPR's new release promised its customers a set of features which were butchered in the final product. The medias went crazy on launch and it lasted for days, weeks. Publishers like the New York Times wrote pretty harsh articles stating nothing but the facts. The game wasn't ready to come out. I have 80 hours of time played on a powerful PC, so I won't address the performance issues related to the consoles, and I also won't keep mentioning the logistics behind the unfinished state of the title. Since the game was first delayed, the marketing of the company completely switched tactics and focused on keeping a high level of interest in the game. As a consequence, countless trailers and features shown during the five episodes of Night City Wire became a tool to keep CDPR's stock value high rather than creating an honest relationship with players. And I'm not saying the issue is this simple, there's in reality so many factors that we can't take into consideration because we don't have the right resources. Who or what caused all these cuts? Time or directions? Investors or management? Clients? It's a complicated combination of everything. Investors want to see profit, management wants to satisfy investors, and clients push a company to release a product just because they've been waiting too long for it. But demanding the release is part of the game. If I want something, I will express one way or another my wish. Does that mean that I can't wait a day, a week, a month, a year? Of course I can, we are talking about entertainment here, so it's way too easy to say that it's the player's fault for having a too high demand. Promises play a big role in the expectations that one person has towards a company. Is it possible to make opposite promises and respect them both? Is it possible to rush a game out but also deliver a product faithful to the embellished marketing campaigns? Definitely not. What hurts the most is that the live events leading up to the 10th of December never lie. They presented the game in its current state but they never said how much it wasn't going to be like the unbelievable footage shown in the past, especially the 48 minutes gameplay from 2018. And, like any marketing team would do, they avoided all the possible bugs and glitches. I am completely fine with this, until the latters are the reason why I can't enjoy even the short main story, which should be perfectly polished, especially because that's what an initial impression is based on. The last month, brought countless videos on the internet comparing the final product to some incredible aspects shown in the past, so I won't focus on that. Trimming down a game is completely fine. Selling a trimmed down game to a customer hypnotized by the non-trimmed down version isn't, especially when there's nothing to fill in the void. This tells me that the free DLC will probably focus on expanding the free roaming experience, the mechanics, minigames and side activities rather than providing immediately new branches for the story. So what is the result? A powerful set of deep characters with detailed storylines moving in a city that is only visually impressive. Well, let's take it one step at a time. After a big spoiler alert, you don't want to ruin your first experience in Night City because I don't know if you will ever have a second one and you'll see why. The Witcher saga proved to the world that CDPR has some of the best writers in the industry. Every quest, especially the secondary ones, tells a different story or adds to the previous narrative with a new element, whether it's the development of a character, a significant discovery, a fascinating piece of lore. Cyberpunk 2077 does the same, but it adds the first person view, which was criticized by many for not being the best solution in what is supposed to be an RPG where cosmetics matter, especially because V's reflection only appears in programmed mirror animations. Seeing everything from V's eyes gives a whole new meaning to dialogue interactions. You are not spectating, you are the protagonist. I have to say it's a very bold move that not everyone is willing to take. 
it's a double-edged sword. On one side, it avoids all the complications of third-person animations. On the other, it creates a series of technicalities which result in a difficult exchange between the player and the world. Being able to move around during a dialogue can trigger an animation in advance, it can provoke another character which will then interrupt what the main conversator is saying, and so on. And most of all, it represents a big challenge for the fighting mechanics and the interactions with objects. This results in very very bad fist matches, uncomfortable katana swinging, and a general lack of satisfaction in making a move. Taking down an enemy, for example, with a stealth approach is definitely not fun at all. On the contrary, it's all based on the same animation over and over again, with the only variable being if you want to hide a body in a storage unit or a wardrobe. It's a matter of seconds before you stop walking and you start hovering, not to mention boss fights. I would have preferred cutscenes to this underwhelming buggy experience. Both Oda and Smasher were supposed to be the peak of difficulty and the moment of a glorious confrontation. Instead, they turn out to be a 30 second takedown with, once again, no AI and half of the sounds missing. Does the narrative progression suffer from all of this? Only partially. The writing in Cyberpunk 2077 is outstanding, but timing isn't because it's completely obstructed by the constant glitches and the unprogrammed AI. While it is repetitive to say that the game is clearly unfinished, it's also important to underline it. There's many games that come out at launch with several issues. It's almost the standard with the current situation and with tighter and tighter deadlines. But I've rarely seen something in this state. So many moments were ruined by absent or retreating enemies, painful breaks between one line of dialogue and the next. The quest forward to death is the perfect example. We are almost at the end of the game. It is a matter of minutes before chaos begins or a solution to V's problem is finally discovered. In this discomforting atmosphere, the Aldecaldos drive towards the Arasaka tunnel in what is supposed to be one of the most epic fights. In reality, everything is blunt. Enemies spawn slowly, there's no significant soundtrack, the other characters move randomly without transmitting any idea of fear or courage. How can writing come to surface when so many issues try to bury it deeper and deeper? Every dialogue has its meaning and the plot follows a series of events which progress organically. It's easy to lose the tempo when diving into countless side gigs, but it remains a great tale, told through each and every one of the peculiar protagonists and co-protagonists. The feeling of oppression that the corporations operate on the city is perceived everywhere, from the mega buildings where most people live to the more comfortable neighborhoods where the middle class settles in hope to become more powerful. In this environment, V wants to become someone, a legend. But the word legend in Night City is as vague as it can be. A rock star slash terrorist is a legend. A brain dance actor at the peak of fame is a legend. An intimidating fixer who knows everything and everyone is a legend. So what is our role? In the beginning, V bets everything on the lifestyle of a mercenary who accepts gigs and tries to make money. This is indeed a way to become someone. But before he can get a grip on his position in the city and destroy the social ladder that every person, inside and outside the corporations, despises but can't get enough of at the same time, he's forced to deal with the relic and, by consequence, with Johnny. From this moment on, the plot takes V on a journey that explores every perspective. For the first time, he gets to see with his own eyes a son killing his father to take over a company, his best friend dying in front of him, and soon he discovers that there's not much time left before the relic kills him too. The relationship with Johnny is developed flawlessly and it's incredibly detailed, both in the main quests and the side quests. Keanu Reeves' character isn't just part of the principal storyline, he's part of V's life. Once the right premises are set, the game presents more and more personalities without ever being boring or repetitive. Judy is an expert of brain dancing and she's always ready to help a friend in danger. River is a caring uncle who would do anything for his family. Takemura struggles in finding his own space between the strong respect he has for the murdered Saburo Arasaka and a more down-to-earth existence in the city. But there's so much more. Rogue, Pan Am, Carrie, Evelyn, Dex, 
Fingers, Saul, Mitch, Brigitte, Ald. Everyone has a place in this compelling story. Quest after quest, these attention turns to a deep self-reflection and, as a consequence, to existence itself. After this massive series of events, it's finally up to you, the player, to decide if six months more to live are worthy of not giving Johnny another chance in the world. I knew this moment was coming, but I never thought it was going to be so well written and powerful. Is V a legend in the end? Is it Johnny playing the role of the legend? Or is the real legend the person that comes out from that fatal choice? A badass rock star with V's sacrifice on his conscience? Or a V who decided that it's his body and that life is still worth living, even with an expired date? So to go back to the first question. Does writing come to surface when so many issues try to bury it deeper and deeper? Yes, Cyberpunk 2077 is touching, genuine and complete in telling a raw story. That being said, it is still exposed to contradictory lines of code, which sometimes weaken the consequences of completing a cycle of creative side quests. This is where it becomes difficult to separate a technical bug from a structural narrative problem. Judy's cycle of missions, for example, bother me the most. The last one explores her past in an innocent and almost palpable way. V and her go scuba diving to find the place where she used to live, now buried underwater. An homage to Radiohead's Pyramid song, also the name of the quest, which replicates the visuals of the music video. And right after they swim back to the surface and decide to rest, Judy says what we never wanted to hear. She's leaving the city. You know you'll never see her again, this is it. But she leaves you the keys to her apartment. Why? I left that question unanswered for a few hours of gameplay, but then I decided to check out her place. And what do I see inside? Judy! talking about her stuff that happened way before in the story, while V's thoughts about her leaving town play over it. I'm driving right now, so it's perfect timing. So, is this a writing issue or a simple bug? But most importantly, why do we get the keys to her apartment? We all heard talking about Chekhov's gun countless times. If a gun appears in a story, this gun will be used. Then why do we get the keys? What is there to find in the apartment? A couple quotes on the time gone? On Judy leaving? And how can this impact us when Judy is standing right there by mistake or by design? And it's not the only time that the world progression isn't coherent. Lucius Ryan, the mayor, is found dead in one of the side quests. But then you keep hearing on the radio that him and ambitious Perales are still fighting to take the role as leaders of the city. Same for Kerry Eurodyne. Whatever path you took in his set of quests, if you visit his mansion, he talks like nothing happened, while also acknowledging past events. It's kinda contradictory. I have to admit, though, that some dialogues are so real and personal that they leave a deep mark in the cyberpunk experience. Witnessing a modern-day messiah recording a brain dance about Jesus on the cross, investigating with the river and getting to know his family, getting a glimpse at the dirty politics with the Perales, helping a guy fix his painful junk, Reuniting Samurai for one last show, witnessing the sad reset of a friendly vending machine. I admire the work put into making each of these quests unique and interesting. Still, mistakes like seeing Judy again break the spell and many other things do, but not as much as the environment. What makes Night City worth exploring? Whether you start as a corpo, a street kid or a nomad, seeing Night City for the first time is a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Layers over layers of streets and bridges, people everywhere. Too good to be true, right? Kind of. While being visually stunning, almost unbelievable, especially thanks to the heavy graphic engine which made me question if my skin is less real than the one in the game, this is where the magic ends. The realistic exchanges with NPCs, which we were promised, are replaced by zombies, appearing, walking around in circles, and then just disappearing. This is valid both for pedestrians and car drivers, which don't have any reactions to what's happening and don't make you feel in any way like you are someone in the city. And I say this because one of the features of the game is having a street cred, so a reputation, which in reality simply translates in unlocking new missions without influencing the AI's behavior in any way. If the city is dead, so are its activities. How many times did I see an open sign for a place that can't be accessed? How many clubs I visited once for a side quest 
before realizing that there's no reason to go back, if not for the music, which is a separate topic. How often did I go to a specific location, if not to take another marker off the map or just toggle the photo mode? Cyberpunk lacks a free roaming experience. It sounds unbelievable, but it is true. In my first walkthrough, I finished both main and side quests before going through the ending. Once I was asked if I want to go back to the last checkpoint, I stopped wondering, why should I? I did everything I could, and buying all the cars is definitely not a good enough reason. Rockstar has an unbeatable reputation for creating immersive open worlds where free roaming is what people prefer to do instead of progressing right away with the story. When I played a lot of Red Dead Redemption 2, it took me hundreds of hours before I finally decided to finish the narrative aspect of the game. Here. The narrative is the only thing that pushes you from one place to another. There's nothing in between. No bar to sit at, no restaurant to consume a meal, no option to call and hang out with the long list of contacts on your phone, although some interactions on the device are interesting and coherent with the progression of the main quests. The Witcher 3 was similar to Cyberpunk in this regard, but it was executed much better with much more content and much more stuff to do, especially with the addition of Gwent, monster hunts, treasure hunts. Here there are enemies and obstacles, but they suffer the same zombie syndrome as the rest of the AI not to mention the police and the gangs. I was really hoping for a much deeper development of this aspect. Joining a gang, helping the police, fighting against both, but none of this is really there. Instead, there's a broken wanted system whenever you shoot at someone in the city center and an unnatural reaction from gang members when you get too close. No chance to get to know them better, no chance to exchange words, if not for specific quests. I have to give credit to the level designers for creating a rich visual environment. Every object looks perfectly placed and at the same time random. Every district has a different visual language, whether it's given by the gang's graffitis or the architecture. The empty badlands, the dense city center, the nationalistic Rancho Coronado, the abandoned Pacifica. And I also have to give credit to the graphical results. Ray tracing truly shines and makes every street and every corner more alive and fascinating. Reflections, shadows, incredible lighting, volumetric fog all contribute in giving density to a well-designed night city. The the only question left is, where is the open world in this so-called RPG? Where are my choices? What's my impact? To stay in my apartment forever and not be able to even purchase different properties like the diner trailer promised? Being an RPG-esque game, Cyberpunk 2077 offers the possibility to choose how to progress through the story by picking main quests and side activities however we wish. While following V's research for a solution to the relic implanted in his head, we also unlock new branches in the story. We set the new roots in the ground that this game is planted on. And this is in fact a choice, because we can also skip all the extras and only play the main storyline. But it's difficult for me to say that this is a satisfying choice. When I think of the definition of this word, I have open options in my mind, not a simple yes or no. Yes meaning that I get to know or obtain something more, no meaning that I can completely skip a portion of writing. And this is what this game does. I don't know if you bought the official guide for the game, but I did. I opened it after my first playthrough, hoping to be mind blown by a complex systems of actions and consequences. Instead, after a very detailed description of all the outcomes that the quests the pickup can have, it's the one where you try to cut a deal with Maelstrom to retrieve the flathead, the following pages lack of the same amount of freedom, with the linear descriptions of quests and rare options, like how to approach Woodman and later Hellman. The game tries to solve this linearity with the very harsh choice I talked about earlier. How to get into Arasaka and how to end Johnny and V's relationship. And to even further give meaning to the few real choices and all the hours spent on side quests, the end titles show a sequence of messages received from the other characters in the narrative. It's an easy way to prove that decisions matter, but it is definitely not enough for me that they do only after the ending. Once again, it's difficult to judge an unfinished product. I don't criticize the game for its linearity. On the contrary, a story can often be stronger if the possible outcome is only one. Here, it's not only one, but it fully depends on the final choices. My impression is that a lot of content is planned for the game outside of the main plot, but it's still not ready. 
This results in focusing only on the story and looking for any possible way to impact the direction it takes. Whenever I criticize an aspect of the game, I almost feel guilty and sad at the same time because the days building up to its release really made me dream and now this is the situation we're experiencing. The really good on one side, the really bad on the other. But there's also something in the middle. I can't talk about Cyberpunk without mentioning its incredible soundtrack and the refreshing choice of songs heard on the radio which offers different genres. When you can associate a melody to a moment, it means it hit the right spot, it triggered an emotion. And both the score and the vehicle playlists do. Conrad Old Money's Gangs is what each one of us associates to the fun evenings spent analyzing the different footage shown at night City Wire one to five, and hearing it in its full version while driving around the colorful lights is an experience I can't forget. Like I also can't forget listening to Pan Am, Judy or Johnny speak while the same melody plays over and over again. Or the Rebel Path, both the standard version and the cello one which accompanies Johnny's adventures in the past. Or all of Samurai's songs which tell the story of an iconic band whose final goal is to never fade away. But once again, the magic spell isn't strong enough. The colorful choice of songs and melodies can't hide the fact that half of the sounds in these games are missing. No car doors opening and closing, no wind howling, flat footsteps, quiet nightclubs. You never get to dive deep into what could be one of the best sounding games given its resources. I was expecting much more, especially because I've seen all the interviews of how they recorded sounds for the vehicles, there was a deep dive into this section of the production of the game. But unfortunately, the final result is unpolished and unfinished. CDPR has a great potential to make Cyberpunk better and it definitely can't leave the game in its current state. Especially because this would mean losing trust forever and not being able to sell a consistent number of copies with a new release in the future. But its launch will be remembered forever and taken as another example of bad management and expectations set too high because of visionary promises. Cyberpunk 2077 is leaving a deep mark in the industry's history, there's no denying. A torches launch which led to opposite reviews from perfect scores to angry zeros. The old gen consoles added fuel to this huge debate. I'm a big fan of the writing but I can't stop wondering if the game can be considered better than many others. In fact, in the current state I don't see it reaching any mountain top. When and if this game is fixed and true RPG and free roaming content is added, it will for sure become one of the best games of the generation. I appreciate CDPR for finding the courage to do a game completely in first person. I appreciate all the effort put into the writing which stands out many many times. I appreciate the visual aspect. The close rendering is unbeatable, especially for the main characters which are as detailed as possible. Same goes for the world rendering which has the potential to grow even more especially because right now, even on a very powerful PC, there's a lot of problems related to draw distance and there's a lot of visible loading processes. There's so many aspects to appreciate, love, hate and analyze, the visual beauty never ends. And I hope the effort to make this game better doesn't either.